Amen. We continue our series, Jesus, Our Redeemer, Part 3 today. Jesus, Our Redeemer, Part 3. I titled today's message, In Front of Their Eyes. In Front of Their Eyes. But look at your name and say, in front of your eyes. From the very start, people would have a problem with believing in Jesus and trusting in him for salvation. When he came into the world, we saw some of that last week. The religious leaders could not stand the fact that Jesus was claiming to be God. We looked at it last week that he's all God, he's all man. He's unique in all his ways and there's never ever been a man like Jesus. And there will never ever be a man, a God man like Jesus. Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God. And we saw last week, after Jesus read in the book of Isaiah about himself, they were all amazed at his words that flowed from his mouth. In Luke chapter 4, verse 22, we saw it last week, but in verse 28, which we didn't get to, the tables turn. <laughs> And they get so mad that they try to kill Jesus. Uh, uh, they were just amazed at what he just read. And he was talking about himself, but you go down a little bit further, verse 28, so all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. What happened? And rose up and thrust him, and rose up and thrust him out of that city, and they led him to the brow of the hill. So this crowd grabs him and they take, they drag him through the city to the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Right. Every time I read that, that blows my mind. Now, if nothing convinced you before, people, y'all got to hold them, right? Mm -hmm. And you're holding them real good, and you dragging them through the city, and you determined to kill them now. And they want to throw him over the cliff and somehow, some way, because he's God, he slips right through their fingers. They got him and he gets away and it says he walks right through him. Not missing a beat. How come he walking right through him? That, that should have got their attention. We trying to kill him and can't kill him. We throwing him over this cliff. We got him in our hands. He gets out somehow. One man against many people. And he gets out of their hands. And then he walks right through the middle of the crowd. And he goes his way. This has got to be more than the average man. And one of the amazing things about Jesus is that he could not die before his time. Right. Right. He had to die by way of the cross, according to the scriptures, even though they tried to kill him many times. This ain't the only time, but without success. Turn to John, St. John, chapter 7. St. John chapter 7. And I want to do some reading here today. I'll try, to, I'll try to be quick about it. 
But I probably shouldn't say that because you know what happens every time I say it. Verse 25. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? How about Jesus? But look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? Uh-oh, they confess it. This is truly the Christ? Uh-oh, we get ready to deal with his origins. However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, you both know me and you know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, uh oh, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. Now that, gonna th that throws them for a loop. But I know him, for I am from him. Uh oh, wait a minute. Uh oh, that's messing them up now. What is he saying? And he sent to me. Put them in a ball of confusion now. Let them scratch their heads. Therefore they sought to kill him. But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. They want to kill him. And much as they want to kill him with grinding their teeth. Yes. They can't do it. Because it wasn't his hour yet. And many of the people believed on him and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? Uh-oh, we got him now. Because he's doing miracle signs and wonders. And never had a man done anything like this before than had ever lived and not since. Then the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. So they wanted to take him. But they can't take him. They can't do anything to him, even though they want to do it to him. Now, I want to leave there, and I want to go to John chapter 8. Flip over to John chapter 8. As you can see, they seek to kill him, but he can't die before his time. Right. And he has to die a certain way. Right. John chapter 8, look at verse 52. 52, then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Come on, wait a minute. God cannot have a demon inside. Amen. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death? Are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Question on the floor. They dig him now. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Uh-oh. Oh, no. What you say? Yet you have not, not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. Uh oh, now they get heated up. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. So they ain't nothing like Abraham, who they claiming and lifting up so high. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Because he's only 33. Right, right. <laughs> and have you seen Abraham? Now, this is where it gets. 
Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, before he was born, before he came into the world, before he was conceived in his mama's womb, he said, before he was, I am. Now don't take that light. Because to the Jews, that was saying something. Because I am is the God of the Old Testament. Jesus was basically saying, I am Yahweh. I am means, that's the name of Yahweh. The God of the Old Testament. So he's basically saying, before Abraham was uh, Yahweh, I am. He's claiming to be God. He's telling them who he is. They don't want to hear that. Because anytime somebody says, or they equivalent themselves to being God, that is blasphemy. Right. And now you're worthy to die right now. Right. We, you get ready to die right now. You don't say you Yahweh. And the thing about the name Yahweh, they wouldn't even speak that name. Right. It was too sacred. It was too holy. You dare not utter his name. Before Abraham was, I am. And they could not stand that. Then they took up stones to throw at him. Look at that. Oh, see, immediately they wait to wait to kill him now. You talk about you Yahweh, you God. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Uh, uh, how? How do you do that? He's God. It said he went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. Anybody in here? No one in here can escape a crowd that's mad at you and they got stones in their hands and you're going to go right through the midst of that will not happen. Amen. You're going to die in a few seconds trying to walk your way through there. You won't take one step. But Jesus walked right through the midst of them and it says so passed by. What are we looking at? A miracle. Amen. How come this was not getting their attention? He's showing them that you want to kill me, and you can't kill me. My time has not come yet, and I'm done. And you can't kill God. That's right. Amen. He said, no man take my life, but I lay it down. When he died on the cross, he laid down his life. Amen. He said, this command have I received from the Father. I have the power to lay it down. Take it up again. He controls it all. Amen. So they could not take his life. He couldn't die before his time, and he had to die a certain way. Right. Somebody say certain way. Certain way. Time and time again, Jesus miraculously escapes a premature death. They cannot kill him. This is one of the reasons why Satan tried to tempt him, or he did tempt him, in the wilderness. In Matthew 4. It's Luke 4. Also, supporting there, he tells them to jump off, jump down. If you're the son of God, jump off of here, jump off of this temple. And we're talking about hundreds of feet to the ground. That's why show yourself that you're God. I don't want to jump down. Almost like the jump off and kill yourself. You, you know, you know. That was not the way that he was supposed to do this thing. He's to go to the cross. And nothing was going to stop him from the cross. Nothing. 
when the devil would have loved to try to sabotage our salvation. But he could not do it. Because Jesus was who he said he was. And he was going to that cross. No matter what. Turn to John chapter 10. St. John chapter 10. Verse 25. And it reads, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe me. The works that I do, my Father's name, uh, in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. See, this is why people who never believe, never come to believe, because they are not of his sheep. They are not of his family. How, what the hell? How come they don't ever get saved? They're not of his master. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. See, this is why people come to Jesus. Because they're actually his sheep. And his sheep hear his voice. And I know them and they follow me. Right. Amen. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Ain't that so? Ain't that good news? Yeah. That the devil cannot deceive you. He cannot take you away from the Lord no matter how much he tries. No one. No false prophet, no false religion. Bring it on. Nothing can snatch you out of his hand when you're his sheep. My father, verse 29, who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. You was doing okay, but now you done went to, what? I and my father are one. Remember I talked about it a little bit about that last week about the image? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like he's a mirror image as I was describing last week of God. When you look in the mirror and you see Jesus you just see God. Because he is the exact copy of God. Not different. Verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Ooh, again, why can't they leave him alone? They constantly trying to kill him and they cannot do it. Jesus answered them, many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, For good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself God. But see, they just didn't understand. He was more than a man. He was man, God and man. I described that last week in the hypostatic union that I described. He's God and man. They did not get that. So now they want to kill him. This is why they want to stone him. Let's get down to verse 36. Do you say of him whom the, uh, the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do... Though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore, they sought again to seize him. Woo-wee! He had a way of stirring up the crowd, of rubbing them the wrong way. I guess that's why I like to kind of rub people the wrong way when I preach. 
send out that convicted word. Find your high place. Shine the spotlight on it. Go where they live. Jesus did that all the time. Therefore, they sought the death to seize him, but he escaped out of their hands over and over again. He escapes miraculously out of their hands because he's God. Amen. He walks right through them over and over again as if they are not even there. This should have caused them to think a minute and realize the miracle that they were witnessing right before their eyes. This is happening right before your eyes. We can't even kill him. As much as the religious leaders hated Jesus, he could not die before his time. Amen. Amen. It had to be on the cross. Hallelujah. That brings me to this point. No matter how the devil tries, he will not kill you before your time. Amen. The devil cannot kill what God has shielded. Yes. He can't kill what God is shielding. He cannot do it. So you don't have, ever have to worry about dying before your time. Because if God has you for a purpose, has you here for a purpose, you're going to go get to that place. Amen. No matter how much the devil comes against you and tries to block you and stop you and get in the way and hinder you. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, fix your eyes on Jesus, you will get to your intended destination. You'll get there. You'll rise there all the time. Prophecy had to be fulfilled concerning Jesus' death. It couldn't go down any other way. If Jesus was who he said he claimed to be, the scripture had to be fulfilled. Psalms 22 verse 14 through 18 speaks of the suffering Messiah. The suffering Messiah and how he would die on the cross. Psalms 22 turn there quickly. Psalms chapter 22 verse 14 Speaks of the suffering of sight. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. And this is a reference to when he was hanging on the cross. Because when they dropped that cross down in the hole, and he's nailed to that cross, what happened was each bone got disconnected from the other bone. With the jolt when they pre pu push that down into the ground. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shed. And my tongue clings to my jaw. Because he's losing blood. He's on there and he's sweating. He's become emaciated. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. It's a reference to how he was nailed to the cross with those six inch spikes through his wrist and through his feet. And he did it all just for you. Amen. He was so amazing. Look at verse 17. I can count all my bones. 
see his ribs. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments, the soldiers did among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. All of this was prophetic before it even happened. The suffering Messiah. Now they had the scripture to look back and see what was happening, but no matter what, they still did not want to believe, and this was happening right before their eyes. Jesus even quotes verse 1 of Psalms chapter 22. At the top of that, half of that verse where he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he's on the cross, he's quoting scripture. Because at that moment, that was the first time in his existence that he felt separated from the Father. Never had this been had happened before. God had to turn his back on Jesus when he was on the cross because he's representing us sinners. And God cannot stand to look at sin. Why? Because he's that holy. He's that pure. He's that righteous. He's that awesome. He can't look at sin. Jesus was willing to go through that, being feeling that separation from the Father. On the cross, just because you were on his mind. See, he paid a heavy price. This thing is a big deal. This is no walk in the park. He paid a heavy price for our salvation. Amen. Why? Because he so loved the world. He so loved you. He so loved God. And in keeping with Christmas, this was God's greatest gift to humanity. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, why have you forsaken me? Imagine how he felt on that cross during this time. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, speak of, speaks of how Israel will mourn in repentance over the one who they pierced. The day is soon to come when they will look to Jesus, the one who they rejected and crucified. This is prophetic in Zechariah. When Jesus returns, to rescue Israel and set up his earthly kingdom for the millennial reign, 1,000 year reign. That's in the future, that's coming, and it's not that far away. Israel will turn back to God. The one they rejected, one that did not believe when he came the first time, they rejected him. Even though he revealed his deity right before their very eyes, showing them hundreds of miracles, signs, and wonders, they still refuse to believe as a nation. That's kind of like some people today. God can reveal himself to folk over and over again. And they still ignore him. They still won't bow the knee. Right. They still won't confess him as Lord. They still won't repent for their sin. Mm. The forgiveness is for everybody. Yes. Amen. 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 Everybody can be forgiven for their sin. Amen. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. What you've done, how much you've done it, who you've been doing it with, how many times. None of that matters when you repent and you come to Jesus and allow him to wash you from the inside out. That's the price he paid on Calvary. That's why he shed his blood. The 
blood of Jesus washes you whiter than snow. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. But many people ignore that. The rejection of the Messiah opened up the way for the Gentiles. When Israel, the Jews, rejected him, it opened up the way for you and I. We are non-Jews. And he came for his own. He came for the Jews. But when they rejected him, then he said, well, let me go to the ones who are non-Jews. That's right. Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. So their rejection actually turned into a blessing, an opportunity for us to be saved so that no one gets left out. Ooh, I felt that one. I got to calm down right about now. Right now, take a chill pill, Pastor, right now. Can't do like I did last week. Woo! Slow down. Because talking about this gets me. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You talk about what the Savior did. Yes, sir. This is an awesome thing that God has did for us. We ought not take it for granted. We can't thank him enough. Hallelujah for what he's done. The price that he paid. You could never repay Jesus back. And this is why no one can work their way into heaven. Right. This is why people can't be good enough to get into heaven. And this is why it's only one way to get into heaven. Because Jesus died. He made the way out of no way. And that's why he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the way that God has made it. There are no many roads or many ways to heaven. There's only one way, and it's the Jesus way. Sorry, Buddha. That road will send you to heaven. Sorry, Muhammad. That road will send you to heaven. The only road is the Jesus road. That's the highway to heaven. And Jesus makes that clear, there are two roads. The broad road and the narrow. And the broad road leads to hell. And, and he said, many be on that road. It's jam-packed. It's crowded. That's the popular road. That's the in now road. Everybody I know, oh, they're my homies on Broadway. Let me go down there. You just don't know. That's leading to nowhere or somewhere straight to the pit of hell. Oh, yeah. You better get off wrong road and get on narrow way, the straight way. And he said, few be, there's few that find this narrow road. Amen. Amen. How come it's few on that road? Because it's calling for something. Right. It's calling for too much. This is why the Bible is so unpopular now these days. And Christianity and Jesus. They want all inclusiveness. But everything is the way. That's a lie. Jesus said it's one way. And it's him and him alone. Hallelujah. And it might not be politically correct. But it's biblically accurate and correct. That's all I care about. I don't care about no political correctness. Forget that. I'm trying to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. I can care less about politically correct and people's feelings. Jesus didn't care nothing about that. It's about trying to get people out of hell into heaven. Amen. 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 I'm anointed. Amen. I'm 
I'm singing it under anointing. Amen. <laughs> That means you agree. Amen. Yes. Amen. That's why Jesus gives a call to all. Yes. Clarence called on. He says, come unto me, all his labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's for everybody. That call goes out to all. Everybody who's weighed down with burdens, all you that lay, he says, come. The cares of this life, he says, come. If you're oppressed and depressed and underpressed and overpressed and overwhelmed, Jesus says, come unto me. He says, because I will lighten up your load. The heavy laden, all you that labor, and heavy laden. Take a look at those words. What is he saying? I can carry what you cannot carry on your own. Amen. And you need some help, whether you will not realize it or not. And the help that you need is divine help, which only Jesus provides. Jesus says, bring it to him. You got to take it to him. Heavy laden. You're laboring in life. This is the season where there are the most unhappy, depressed people. Yes, Surveys say that. Yes, and that's been the way for many years. Yes, During this holiday season. Yes, the ending of a year, and we're at the precipice at the beginning of a new year. Yes, and people are thinking of all kinds of stuff. That year that had not been so favorable to them. Right. People lost loved ones and friends and associates and acquaintances. They're thinking of that. Yeah. They're thinking of going into a new year, a new way, having to adjust to new things. What's on the horizon? Burden down, heavy laden. Jesus says, "Take my yoke upon you and learn." Amen. And you will find rest for your souls Amen. in the same verse. For my yoke is easy. Amen. Everybody gonna be yoked up to something. That's right. And if you yoked up to anything other than Jesus, you carrying a heavy load. Amen. Amen. That's why he said, all you that labor and are heavy laden, because you yoked up to a whole bunch of other stuff. He says, trade your yoke for my yoke. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. One of the ways that they train uh, young oxen on the farms is that they yoke them up to a more experienced ox. Who's been there and done that. Who has the experience. This is where that's taken from. They take the wooden instrument and they hook it up on the neck of the ox. And the older one trains the inexperienced one. What to do, how to do, what to, all of the whole nine yards. One of the things that the young inexperienced ox doesn't know is that most of the weight and the labor has been shifted on the more experienced ox. To where the younger one, the big experienced one, is basically just going along for the ride. He's yoked. But the load ain't that heavy. Why? Because the bigger, more strong, experienced one is carrying the majority of the load. Jesus says, yoke up to me. Trade your yoke for my yoke. For my yoke is easy. You've been trying to do this on your own and it's been hard, laboring, heavy laden. But he said, hook up to me. Learn from me. For my yoke 
life is easy and my burden is light. I can handle what you cannot handle on your own. If you're here today and you yoked up to everything but Jesus, it's time to get untied from everything else and get yoked up to Jesus. So he can carry your load and lighten that burden for you. Hallelujah. So going into the new year, don't carry that, old, that, that heavy load. It's time to release that right now. Woo! Talk, Holy Ghost, to somebody that will open up their ears and receive it in Jesus' name. Leave it behind. Take all your stuff to Jesus. Let him carry it. He can handle what you cannot handle on your own. And let me tell you something. I will be quick to give it to him. Don't go into the new year all burning down and yoked down and heavy and laden. Give it to Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. But he's done this thing right before our time.